Into the Depths is a six-part podcast series that follows National Geographic explorer Tara Roberts as she documents black divers and marine archaeologists who are searching for buried shipwrecks from the transatlantic slave trade. Along the way, Tara meets up with the descendants of those brought over on these ships, historians, as well as her friends and family, and comes to new personal revelations about her own family history and what belonging means. The first episode of Into the Depths aired on January 27th, 2022, and is available on Apple Podcasts and wherever people get their podcasts. Tara Roberts, the executive producer and host of the series, is with me to discuss the project. Welcome, Tara. First, let's watch a trailer for Into the Depths. Black scuba divers are searching for shipwrecks from the transatlantic slave trade. It was like diving on a grave site. And honoring the 1.8 million Africans who were lost. I'm National Geographic explorer Tara Roberts, and I dropped everything to travel with these divers. Come to Costa Rica! Join me for Into the Depths, a six-part Nat Geo podcast series starting in January. It's going to be an incredible journey. Now... You were a professional editor of magazines such as Essence and Ebony, a director of communications, a business consultant. How did you get involved in the production of Into the Depths? It's completely by accident. (laughs) (laughs) I I definitely uh, did not go out seeking to tell stories of the slave trade. The best uh, careers are always by accident. (laughs) Yeah, I happened to go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in D.C., and it was there that I saw a picture of a group of primarily Black women scuba divers. They were in wetsuits on a boat, and I'd never seen Black women in wetsuits on a boat before like that. So I was like, who are they? What are they doing? And that's when I discovered that they were a part of this group called Diving with a Purpose, and that part of their mission was to search for and help document these slave trade shipwrecks. So I was amazed, stopped in my tracks, and I was like, what? This is incredible work. These people look like me, and they're doing what? I got to be a part of this in some way. So how many divers are affiliated with this group? The group itself has trained to date around 500 divers from around the world in this method of how to map a shipwreck. They are volunteers, so they're not paid to do this work in any way. And they come from all walks of life. Like these people are students, teachers, engineers, filmmakers, policemen. They're just people who have a passion for scuba diving and who wanted to make a difference. At what point the trajectory of your entire life change while you are learning to dive and getting into this whole new experience? When I called them up after I saw them in the museum, I actually didn't call to join them or to tell stories about them. I, at the time, I was working for a nonprofit and this uh, organization supported incredible people doing incredible work around the world. So I just thought the founder of this organization was brilliant and had an incredible vision. So I was like, well, maybe I can help them get funding. So I called them up to see if I could nominate them for a fellowship. And that started a conversation that went on for a couple of months. They didn't ultimately get the fellowship, but the founder, who's a gentleman named Ken Stewart, and he is to date, he's 77 years young and still dives. So I called him up. It didn't work out. And he he was like, he, he calls me uh, by my full name. So that that's how we got to know each other over time. And he was like, Tara Roberts, do you know... <laughs> that you live in the epicenter of black scuba diving. And I was like, what? I was living in DC at the time. So I was like, what? What? Washington (laughs) DC. Hello, Washington DC. But he was like, no, this is where the legends of black scuba diving live. And he was like, you gotta come dive with us. He got me a, a spot in the class that was being taught by this group called the Underwater Adventure Seekers. And they are so fascinating. They are the oldest black diving club in the United States. What was that going through your mind when you first started your first dive? I wasn't a scuba diver, but I was a big swimmer and I love the ocean. And I was like, I want to get down there and I want to explore. How long was the training? It was three months and it was twice a week classes. Like they don't play. They're like the people who come out of our training are really going to be able to handle themselves under the water. So I did that for three months and then... I got my scuba certification in June of 2017. And then I went on my first ocean dive with the group 
in October. And so I knew that I wanted to participate in diving with a purpose. And diving with a purpose requires you to get 30 ocean dives under your belt. So when I did that first ocean dive, it was in Mexico with mm -hmm. the Underwater Adventure Seekers Club. So when it was like, I don't know, like 40 of us that descended on a resort in Cozumel. And so it's all these black people diving and people were like, what? And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Like 40 of us just coming in strong. In that moment, I started to think there's a story here. People needed to know that these people existed and that they were doing this sort of work in the world. I'm a journalist by trade. Storytelling, that's like my root. So you changed your career and then you became a National Geographic Explorer and you were the first Black explorer to be featured on the cover of National Geographic magazine. <laughs> How did that all come about? Well, so February of 2018, I was like, I am going to tender my resignation and pursue this full time. And at the, the time, I didn't have an assignment. I didn't have funding. I didn't know if anybody would care about this story. But I think sometimes when you start down a path, like doors that otherwise would not have been there suddenly appear and they open for you. Exactly. So some sort of way in my inbox, I found a notice about Nat Geo's Explorer grant. And I was like, well, this is a story about the ocean, it's people, and they were doing storytelling grants at that time. And so I applied for a grant, didn't know if I would get it or not. It was like, just put it in and we'll see what happens. That was in June. And by September, I heard back from Nat Geo and got the grant. And so that gave me the funding to that I needed to life. travel with them. I was like, I'm just going to follow them and write blogs about it. But the longer I was on the journey, the more I was like, man, this is way bigger than like two, 300 word blogs. This is a big story to tell. Let me tell it as an audio story. Now, why do you think the establishment of a scuba diving of, of the black community is so important other than just we're scuba divers, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. So remember I, I mentioned the Underwater Adventure Seekers Club mm -hmm. that was started in 1959. Mm -hmm. That was started by Doc Jones. So mm -hmm. he is the founder of that organization and is considered really the grandfather of black scuba diving in the U.S. Um, so if you just take it, Take your, your imagination back to 1959. This is before the civil rights movement, when there was a lot of segregation in the US. So Doc Jones, who learned how to dive in the military, found that people didn't want to, they didn't want him on boats. They didn't want to buddy up with him. So to go down when you scuba dive, you have to be partnered with somebody. You can't go down by yourself because it's not safe. He was on boats and people didn't want to buddy up with him because he was black. So he started the Underwater Adventure Seekers Club to create a space where black divers would find acceptance, would mm -hmm. find people who were eager to do the sport and who weren't afraid to connect with him. And what he found after he founded that club was that there were other people interested in diving who also had the same experience around the United States. So the idea came to create more and more clubs in different cities so that more Black folks would have access and support around diving. Now we have a group of Black scuba divers who are now scuba diving for shipwrecks of uh, slave ships that didn't make it to the Americas. How did that all come about? So I mentioned this gentleman, Ken Stewart, uh, the one who calls me Tara Roberts all the time. <laughs> um, Ken was the Southern representative at NABS. So again, this is, I think none of this would have been possible without Doc Jones. He was the visionary that set the stage and the foundation for all of this. But Ken was um, the Southern representative. He was based in Tennessee and he got introduced to an archeologist at a park in Florida, Biscayne Bay National Park. And part of the jurisdiction of a national park is the water 
surrounding the area. Mm -hmm. And so this woman, her name was Brenda Lazendor, was responsible for all the submerged resources that were in that park. And there were shipwrecks there because she was, it was Florida's Biscayne Bay, lots of shipwrecks there. And she thought that there was a shipwreck for the Guerrero, which is a Spanish slave ship that wrecked around Key Largo. So she's the lone archeologist, can just shared that you can't dive without buddies. So she reached out to NABS to see if there were any divers that would be interested in learning how to dive for slave shipwrecks Mm -hmm. so that she could get some help in finding and bringing um, documentation to the Guerrero. She reaches out to Ken, she invites him down. He's like, yeah, that sounds amazing. We'll come down and learn. And Ken was like, this is awesome. And he was like, you know what? Let's invite more NABS members And let's not just dive for fun, but let's dive with a purpose. So then diving with a purpose was created. The the shipwreck of the slave ship, the Henrietta Marie, that was the impetus for diving with a purpose. Can you tell us what the story of that boat was? The Henrietta Marie, it was an English ship and it dropped off captive Africans in Jamaica. And it made more than one trip, but on its way back to England, it uh, got caught in a storm and it wrecked. And the Henrietta Marie is interesting because it was found by accident, a group of salvagers and treasure hunters who were looking for a ship that reportedly had like the richest haul on it. And they eventually found it. Uh, It took them like 20 years to find the ship. But while they were looking for that, and it's like a $400 million treasure that was on that ship. But while they were looking for it, they came across these artifacts from the Henrietta Marie. And they came across things that they knew weren't attached to the other ship. Um, So they brought those up and that group ended up reaching out to Doc Jones and asking the the National Association of Black Scuba Divers if they could bring some of the artifacts and share them with the group. And so, and they brought things like shackles, like really the things that proved that this was a ship involved in the slave trade. And Doc Jones and the rest of NABS, they were so moved by what they saw that they wanted to um, memorialize the wreck. And so they raised money and ended up putting down a plaque um, at the wreck site. Since it had already been found, it had already been documented, many of the artifacts had been brought up. So there wasn't a lot to do with it, but they thought that they could memorialize it. Something you discuss in your podcast, which I didn't know about, was something called the 1870 brick wall. And can you explain what the 1870 brick wall is and how it's impacted Black Americans' ability to know their full story about their own personal and collective ancestry? Sure. The 1870 brick wall is, um, it's a term that genealogists use. And what it means simply is that before 1870, the United States census did not track identifying details of those who were enslaved. So before 1870, it's almost impossible unless you have oral myth or, you know, like artifacts from your family, it's almost impossible to go to the archives to find people. A lot of Africans were stripped of their names, they were stripped of their identities, they were renamed. And even if you knew some of their names, you still can't find those identifying details. So it is almost impossible for most African-Americans to trace back to a ship and definitely to trace back to Africa. Now, how many Africans were taken in the transatlantic slave trade? Yeah, they estimate that it was um, 12.5 million. 12.5 million people. Africans, yeah, that were brought over, and this is a number I did not know, on 36,000 voyages. And by the way, that's 12 and a half million people forcibly moved to the United States. That doesn't include their children and their grandchildren who are also forced into slavery too. So and it doesn't include the number of people who were marched to ships and who died on the way, who were held captive. How many people died in shipwrecks on the way? They estimate that it was about 12%. So it's like 1.8. Million. Can you explain the route that they took? You know, the boat would start somewhere in Europe, go to Africa, go to the Americas. It's called the triangular trade. Uh-huh. So the first leg was from Europe 
to Africa where they would bring trading goods and they would trade those goods for captive Africans. They'd load the Africans on the boats. Who were they trading with? So local uh, ethnic groups would be at war with each other uh-huh. and there'd be prisoners of war and those prisoners would get sold off. We know that the Dahomey kingdom in Benin captured lots of people and sold lots of people. And so the boat would then travel to the Americas, so the Caribbean, South America, North America. That route from Africa to the Americas is called the Middle Passage. Then the Africans would be sold into slavery. That wealth that was created from those sales and also from the work that was being done on plantations would also be loaded onto those boats And that wealth would be transported back to Europe so that you have a triangular trade. And of those, you were talking about the Middle Passage and 1.8 million Africans died. How many shipwrecks is that? Well, they estimate that as many as a thousand ships Uh wrecked. And to date, less than 20 of those wrecks have been found. So there is an enormous amount of history that's just out there that's lost. What is the process of finding a ship? Oh. <laughs> it's not easy. I can imagine. <laughs> Most slave ships were built primarily out of wood because they were built in the 1600s and 1700s. So when they would wreck, the wood would splinter. And so these boats are in pieces on the ocean floor. And because they're in pieces, Those pieces are often encrusted in coral or marine life has made homes out of it or it's covered in sand. So it's really, really hard to see. The search for these wrecks doesn't start in the water. It starts in the archives. There are actually lots of records about these ships. And one of the biggest sources of the records is through insurance claims. So Uh when when the ships would wreck, the insurance companies would come in to investigate. And they would take notes. So they would look at logs, crew logs. Sometimes there were court testimonies. So like historians or archaeologists are going through the archives, trying to understand where the wrecking event happened. They narrow down the area. Then they, the archaeologists come in with all the big equipment. So it's magnetometers and sonar scans, and they scan the areas where they think that the wreck happened looking for anomalies. Those anomalies are often metal anomalies. It's like nails or shackles, like the things that they use to restrain people. Um, When they find anomalies, then divers go down to look at those anomalies to see if they are indeed potential artifacts from a shipwreck. And when they find those, then the archaeologists have to do tests to see if it is indeed what they think it is. And then when they confirm that, that's when the part that I learned happens. So now we've identified that there's a wreck site and now that site has to be mapped. And so then you go down with your buddy and you're down there drawing the artifact, you're measuring spaces to see exactly where it is so they can understand the wrecking event and they can build a 3D model to actually show what the ship looked like. Well, we're actually drawing. (laughs) So we're down there with like mylar paper and a pencil. How far do you dive down? Well, the wrecks are actually not that deep because they often wreck on reefs Uh and reefs are closer to the shore. I'd say like average, like 30 feet, something like that. So not super, Uh super far. Now you had said that you were worried about going into the history of the transatlantic slave trade. You consulted with your family, your friends, before you even began working with Diving with a Purpose. What was your concern? I was not looking to tell stories of the slave trade. Like that was not anywhere in my realm of interest. And partly that's because I found looking back at Black history to be hard. And that's primarily because most of the stories that are told about my history tend to center inside of the pain and the trauma. And so when you go back to it, it's, it's traumatizing. Right, like right. it's it's hard, horrible things that happen. Right. There were absolutely moments of sadness, understanding what happened. There's some horrific stories. What I found, so I'll, I'll say it in two ways. I found that there was something really cathartic and 
healing, about actually touching, seeing in person the material evidence of the past. A lot of this past is hidden or is ignored or it's, uh, it's often like, oh, let's not go there. Let's just focus on the future. You start to see people. You don't see faceless statistics, which is how we deal with it. And when it's statistics, like you can't process that. It's just horrific. But when you start to see people, you start to hear these stories. You start to think of names of actual individuals of 1.8 million people, you know, who were mothers, daughters, right. scientists, maybe some of them were writers, like real people. Then they're, they're what I experienced was an opportunity to acknowledge them, an opportunity to honor them. And there is pride in that. There's like power in that. So when I am diving down, I'm realizing that I'm raising my hand along with these divers, these historians, these archeologists. And we're saying, we're not gonna wait for someone who doesn't look like us to decide that this history is important and then to put it in a book. No, we are going to do what we can to help raise it from the ocean depths and bring it back into memory. And that is actually joyful work. Like that feels like I am doing something that heals the past and it heals the future because it is not keeping us in this cycle of trauma and pain. It's allowing us to have closure and you faced your fears and you overcame them and look at how you feel today. And that's just with any person's fear that, you know, yeah. what an amazing story. Now your podcast is full of historical facts. It's amazing what, what you talk about and what you've discovered uh, and things that I didn't know. And certainly I would assume many didn't know the maritime underground railroad, the, yes. the hidden what? network that allowed enslaved persons to seek their freedom along waterways. You heard about Harriet Tubman, but you never heard about the underground waterway and Harriet Jacobs who escaped slavery there. And she wrote a memoir, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And it was published in 1861. And here it is published in 1861. We don't learn about it. Why? It's a bit like I said um, earlier, well, when this area of history hasn't been prioritized in that way, hasn't been deemed um, important. Enough. important. Mm -hmm. And what is told of it is told in broad strokes. And I think that that is because our approach to this history is through often a lens of shame, guilt, anger. Um, it is not looked at as a complex nuanced history that we need to explore. And it's often been told through one perspective. There are a lot of entrees into this history, a lot of voices that have never been heard, which is why it was so important that these black divers are helping to find this history. What do you think your different perspective in life would have been had this been taught to you in school? You're just now learning about this as an adult. There's a lot of pain in the past particularly in, in Black folks history, most of the way that that history is approached sees us as sad people, pitiful people, violent, angry people. It's, it's a little bit of a, like I can feel the, the energy just sort of thinking about it. Um, there's not a way that that history is often looked at fully as a history of courage, a history of resilience, a history of power. There's a way that African-American history starts in slavery and it ends, like even when you look today, it, it ends in discrimination and racism. Like, but our lives are so much bigger than this. They don't, they didn't start there. There's so much more that came before. Like part of what we discuss in the podcast is even the relationship that black folks have with the water. Like there is a huge myth that black people don't swim, that we, we don't have abilities there. But through this research, I discovered that black folks were expert divers in the 1400s and 1500s. Like Europeans used to hire West African divers to help them salvage ships. I don't know if you knew this, but the freestyle swim stroke mm -hmm. was invented by West Africans. I didn't because Europeans that. did not swim in that time period. Like they, it was 
the Middle Ages, right. medical beliefs, religious beliefs, they were kept them out of the water. So they didn't engage with the water. But wow. West Africa is full of hundreds of miles of waterways. So these Africans were making their livings off of the water. They were diving, swimming, making canoes, traveling, trading on the water, and they were expert swimmers. So this is just another sample right. of the kinds of stories we don't learn about our history. History is complex. The global slave trade took place over 400 years. There were four continents involved in the global slave trade. It's Europe, it's Africa, it's South America, it's North America. Do you know there was a way that the world looked before the slave trade and a way that it looked after? It is a monumental event in the shaping of our society today, but we treat it like a footnote. But there's no way that the transportation of 12.5 million people across the Atlantic didn't change coastlines, didn't change landscapes, didn't have a transfer of cultures, religions, beliefs, like happening across all of these ways. It was a monumental moment that has interwoven us, but there's a way that we don't tell any of that story. Wealth was built because of the slave trade. Wealth was lost because of the slave trade. It's huge. And to think that this one little thing that tells us about the ships or that it was horrible in the hold doesn't get at the complexity of the story. Now, on your podcast, you tell a lot of stories about what happened on the slave ships. You talked about a rebellion on a Danish ship, the Fredericus Quartus and the Christianus Quintus. Mm -hmm. And you learn about a female-led insurrection that took place on these ships. And you say that it was the women on the ships, if there were more women on the ships, it was more likely to have a revolt. And that seems at least backwards to what you would think in your head that, you know, the man would be stronger, you know, just physically stronger, be more likely to revolt. Why do you think if it was more women on the boat that there were revolts? Well, I think it's partly because probably the um, people who were restraining them and bringing them to the Americas had that same thought that right. women are weaker, men are not. So that the men were probably more carefully guarded, more restrained than the women. And we do know that a lot of horrible things happened to the women on the ships that didn't happen to the men. There were many sexual assaults mm -hmm. and perhaps there was also a bit of freedom of movement so that those sexual assaults could occur. And we do know that, for instance, in the Dahomey Kingdom, the, the, those fierce warriors that were capturing their neighbors, that that's actually where the story of the Amazons comes from. It's the Dahomey Kingdom, because they had women warriors who would uh. go in and like behead their neighbors as they were capturing them. So there is a history of like, fierce women warriors in West Africa. And it is likely that some of those women were also held oh, no, captive and put on ships. In, in the podcast, when your Ancestry.com results came back, the highest percentage of your DNA was from Benin and Togo, but that didn't surprise you. Why? Well, uh, Benin, Togo, and Ghana make up what was called the slave coast. And so there's a high percentage of African-Americans that likely can trace their roots to that area, but we don't know for sure. Now, based on the oral history of Kujo Lewis, he was a captive people held in barracoons, which are kind of like enclosures where the captured Africans were confined for a limited period. In Benin, they were ordered to walk around the tree of forgetfulness, where they were instructed to forget their identity, forget their culture, forget their history, so that they would become a blank canvas to their slave masters. What was the significance of this obviously very thought out ritual. I think it's another example of like the 1870s, 70 brick wall, like that attempt to erase these people, to, to erase this history, to say that it's not important. No, what's important is what we give you, what we turn you into, but what you were, what you came from, ah, it's irrelevant. So part of this work is all about bringing relevancy to what happened before. As a part of this process, I ended up hiring a genealogist myself to see if I could trace back to a slave shipwreck. And 
she took a lot of the clues that we had in our family lore. And I, I do actually know one ancestor who was born before 1870. The furthest I can trace back is 1837. And that ancestor was born enslaved. But the reason that we know about him is because we have wills, we have pictures, we have things that were passed down through the family, but we're not able to trace back before 1837. So anyway, the genealogists are going through the records. My ancestor uh, served in the military. He was, he fought in the United States uh, colored troops. So it's finding records like that, that begin to help us look back. Now you visited Africa after you got your DNA results back. Was that trip different than previous trips to Africa? Yeah, definitely. Why? On, on previous trips, um, I didn't go seeking belonging, seeking roots, seeking ancestry. But on this trip, I did. And it was challenging because I thought I would be received in a certain way. I'm an African-American coming back home to Africa. But I saw how much I view Africa in a way that I didn't realize through a really Western and colonial lens, that it is a complicated continent it is not a country. It is a continent with 54 countries. And to expect the kind of embrace that I was expecting throughout the continent, which I think a lot of African-Americans do, and that's partly because we don't know. And we're just like, where is home for us? But coming back to the continent in that way, it just didn't take me where I thought I would go. But I think I ended up somewhere that feels powerful. I ended up in a place where I can actually maybe understand identity and belonging in a new way. One of the persons that I interview in the podcast is a young Congolese woman who really challenged me around a lot of stuff. But I asked her if she considered herself Black, a woman who's my complexion in Africa. And she said, no. She was like, that would not be at the top of the identifying details about herself. She considered herself Congolese. She considered herself all these other things, a part of this particular ethnic group, but she did not look at herself as Black. And that is because that is an outside determination that was put on this entire continent that flattened the continent. Again, 54 countries. But to look at this continent and to say, all of you are the same, you're all Black. Like that doesn't happen in Europe. There's not a, you look at Europe and people are not European American, they're German, they're French. There's true. not a connection between these countries, but there's a way that we go back to Africa and we treat it like a small a Africa, like it's a country. It really makes you think. Now you repeat a phrase that you've heard from others that to be African American is to be African without memory and to be an American without any privilege. What does that mean? I think it, it speaks to the feeling of not being wanted anywhere or, or not being able to find a place to land here in the States. Being Black in the States has a certain weight that comes with it. Being American and of this skin color in on the continent comes with its thing. So like we are a people in between, but I don't know that we've thought about that. And one of the things that the young woman from the Congo said to me, which I thought was really powerful, but she was like, what's interesting to me about African-Americans is, yeah, you don't quite have a homeland. You don't, but is there power in that? Like, is there power in being able to pull a little bit from here, a little bit from here and to, newly create who and where you are. Like, are you the future? Are you what the world is moving towards? And that was something I'd never thought about. Could you imagine having power inside of that? Thinking, okay, we don't know. What do we do with that? Like, where do we go with that and, and, and make it a powerful thing? Everybody has a story and it would be beautiful to know your story. It's also beautiful to have a connection that this is who I am. I'm not sure what you do with it, but I certainly have a connection of being Jewish, just like you have a connection of being from Africa or your ancestors from Africa without knowing exactly where and how and who. I don't know where, how and who either, but I have that connection. What, what is your American dream? I think I have more of a global dream. I, I like the vision in Star Trek where there are no more borders um, and boundaries. 
and like everybody is of earth. I kind of think um, these boundaries that we have that separate us and that make us feel like we are different from our neighbors, there's a place for them. Um, or there has been a place for them in the past, but I don't know that there's a place for them in the future. I think the vision that I see for the world is one where we are all treating the planet as our home, like that's our home. These arbitrary borders that were often stolen, <laughs> often like conquered in a really horrible way. That's not the thing that defines us. It's our humanity that defines us. Tara Roberts, congratulations on the success of this amazing project. Into the Depths podcast is available on Apple Podcasts and wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also learn more on the National Geographic website, natgeo.com forward slash into the depths. And Tara's cover feature in the March issue of National Geographic magazine is available online at natgeo.com. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do next and really appreciate the time and you joining me. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it.